So our first presentation then is by uh, Caroline Willekes and Clara Wang. Caroline uh, is Assistant Professor in the Department of General Education at Mount Royal University. She received a PhD in Greek and Roman Studies from the University of Calgary in 2013. She is the author of the book, The Horse in the Ancient World, From Bucephalus to the Hippodrome, and her research focuses on the horse-human relationship in antiquity and its influence on social and cultural identities. Clara Wanning is currently working on a PhD project in political philosophy and aesthetics. Her fields of study include political and social philosophy, contemporary aesthetics, popular culture of film and comics, metal studies, and equine culture studies. She also works as a freelance journalist for the German horse magazine, Cavello, all of which does seem to perfectly combine for this conference. And we're very glad to have them doing a joint presentation this evening. So their paper is titled Wild Eyes and Thundering Hooves, Representations of Equines in Album Art. And I will pass over to you. Uh, so Clara, do you wanna share the screen? Yes, I would now screen share. Two minutes. Can you see? Perfect. All right, so um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon, evening. It's quite early here still, it's only one o'clock in the afternoon where I am, but I gather much later in other places. Uh, so yeah, I'm Carolyn. Um, Clara and I are going, Clara and I are gonna be sort of presenting this paper together. I'm gonna do sort of the historical art, art history context. And then Clara, as the, uh, the metal fan, I will confess, I know very little about metal. Um, I was traumatized by my brother's Iron Maiden posters when I was a kid, um, Eddie Terry terrified me. But um, one of the things when, when Jeremy brought Claire and I together, so thank you, Jeremy, um, we very quickly discovered that there was some really cool stuff that we could explore in the context of album art, especially representations of horses in album art. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Why are horses appearing so frequently in album art and what genres are they appearing in and what are they representing? Why are they there? And really what we're going to sort of argue is that they're not a trope, they're not just like um, a, a, a token uh, culture piece or something like that. There is incredible historical significance to horses um, globally um, and certainly in pre-modern culture, but also modern culture. And so what we're seeing in the album art is a reflection of a very long established sort of cultural art historical tradition about horses that reflects the relevance that horses played in society as individuals, not just as beasts or objects. So there's two parts to our paper. So I'm going to talk about horses and humans uh, in pre-modern art. This is a massive topic, so I'm going to focus very specifically on the types of horse and human partnerships that we're going to be seeing in the album art. And then Clara will give you lots of examples. Um, there's going to be a lot of pictures. So again, please download the slides from the drive if you want to be able to look at some of these images in uh, sort of closer focus. And if you have questions about any of the stuff, if you're interested in sources, um, any ancient, ancient sort of medieval stuff, please feel free to contact me, um, more modern horse iconography, and of course, horses in metal iconography, please feel free to contact Clara. We're happy to share our, our resources with you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so really what we're going to focus on a lot are the warrior and sort of death and the reaper. These were sort of two of the most common themes that we found in the, the many, many, many examples of album art. So what I've tried to do with these iconographic representations is give a broad chronological period. So everything from classical antiquity up until sort of late medieval, early Renaissance. I've also tried to use different mediums. So um, painting, sculpture, fresco, coins. Uh, I think there are some, there are some um, fabric art examples. So again, showing that representations of horses, it's not limited to one place. It's not limited to one artistic medium. It is something that is embedded in society. And I will say we are focusing primarily on European traditions here because a lot of the album art that we have pulled is kind of um, uh, giving a nod to the horse in pre-modern European culture. But these same... Um, styles and motifs and especially the same sort of 
partnership between the horse and the human is something that's found globally in in horse human iconography. So whether we are talking about Central Asia, you know, South Asia, North Africa, um, indigenous First Nations cultures in 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 the Americas, you're going to see these similar patterns because it really speaks to the the intense bond of the horse human relationship. So in terms of the warrior, um, I gave a couple of different motifs here. There is sort of the warrior in his armor with his weaponry sort of riding his horse. And then we have a couple examples, sort of more active examples of the single warrior engaged in some sort of, you know, more energetic action. And what's really fascinating looking at, oh, the Samnite warrior is beautiful. One, and the Samnite warrior, it's a great example of, we're also seeing in certainly three of these five cases, the Samnite warrior, the French king and saint george and the dragon very individualistic horses these aren't just like stamps right they are trying to represent this is a particular horse and in all five examples the warrior basically becomes part of the horse there's almost a centaur type thing going on here in that the energy and the body language of the warrior is reflective of the horse whether it is a calm moment or the more energetic moments of the silver stator and the the raphael painting and what I particularly love about the Raphael painting is that you can see this in all five examples. The horse is almost the main focus. The warrior is there, but in all of these images, your attention is also very much drawn to the horse. It's not just a set piece. You know, and in the case of Raphael's painting, the horse is actually looking at us, right? The horse is like, look at me. I'm helping this dude kill a dragon, right? So they are part of the identity of their warrior, but they also have their own individualistic identity. Next slide. When we get into the battle scenes themselves, so where you have multiple warriors and horses and also foot soldiers, you definitely get a more frenetic energy, which again, is not surprising. Um, I think both the Alexander sarcophagus, um, the Ludovici battle sarcophagus and the battle of uh, San Romano show this so well, where here the horses look less calm, but also the riders perhaps a bit less calm, but there is still this sense of the horse and rider mirroring each other, right? If the rider is having a hard time, like the poor dude being land, being speared by someone in the, in the San Romano painting, the horse kind of reflects that. And then if the horse and rider are sort of calmly attacking, sort of in cohesion with one another, again, you see that mirrored body language. Um, the Ludovici sarcophagus in particular, the horses of the fallen riders, I mean, there is this very anthropomorphized anguish on their faces, much like on the faces of their defeated riders. Um, and even the bio tapestry, I mean, it shows how in all of these different mediums, you know, even in stitching, even embroidery, you can bring this sense of energy and partnership between horses horse and rider through. Um, and of course, I mean, battle is like, if you know anything about horses, the idea of riding a horse to war is monumentally stupid. Horses are afraid of everything. So from a practical perspective, what this art is showing too is the intensity of the partnership that has to exist between horse and rider, right? Or else this is not going to work. And so that's mirrored in their, their, their shared symbiotic body language. Next slide. Uh, then we have the sort of the rider traveler. So sometimes this can cross over with kind of the lone warrior. Um, and sometimes it's almost more like a pilgrim type figure, a warrior kind of going out on a quest. Um, so for example, we have the, the painting from Siena. Um, so this is, uh, you know, we have the, the triumphant kind of general um, who's just conquered these cities that are in the background. Uh, the Greek drinking cup, the Kylix. Uh, this is probably a hunter. We know he's a traveler because he's wearing the traveling hat that looks like a sombrero. It's a Greek thing. Um, and just again, there's sort of this relaxation to kind of how the horse is kind of pacing along and the rider is just chilling on the horse's back, you know, carrying his spears and going off an adventure. Um, the Elbrecht Durer uh, painting, we'll see another one by him in a moment. Um, we have death in the background, which is a bit of a, a spoiler alert for what the next slide is going to look at. But again, here you see this sort of knightly figure confidently riding a confident horse. Um, and the notion, we often see these travel figures, especially um, in medieval art, maybe on their own. Um, we do sometimes get group scenes, but when we see them on their own, there's kind of this extra poignancy to them. And, and we see this in the album art where it's like the lone traveler, the lone warrior and his horse as his only companion, right? And, and traveling by road was dangerous uh, for many reasons. So again, that notion of these two are 
dependent upon one another. The Pope Gregory example, I mean, he's obviously not a warrior, he's a Pope. This is uh, during the, I think the period of the Avignon papacy when there was like a million popes and it was complete and utter chaos and he's coming back into Rome. But I put this one on because on the last set of album art slides, um, there's an album by uh, Opera Diabolicus where like it is 100% riffing on this image, but with a very deaf, <laughs> with the Reaper instead. But otherwise it's like, that's the Pope uh, on a white horse. Um, and again, that mirroring of body language that speaks to that partnership. And next slide. So the one that was a lot of fun for me to investigate because we don't see it in classical art, which is my main area of focus is death and the horse. Um, I suppose on the surface, the idea of putting a uh, death on a horse seems a bit weird because horses would probably be afraid of it, but it becomes a very popular trope. And the reaper and the horse is, um, I think one of the most popular representations of equids in metal album art. So this took some digging. Clara and I were like, what's going on with reapers and horses? Um, and well, in Celtic and Norse traditions, there seems to be some, some idea of the horse almost as a psychopomp, where it can cross between the worlds of the living and the dead. What we're probably seeing in the album art is a reflection of Christian traditions and starting with the four horsemen of the apocalypse from the book of Revelation um, and death rides a pale horse. The colors of the horses are very important. Uh, so we have some examples of the four horsemen, the Durer example and the one from the Ottenreich Bibel, uh, where death's horse looks very different from the others, does look gaunt, does not look like a happy, healthy horse. Um, and we see, see this sometimes in the album art, again, reflecting the fact that death is, is not depicted as particularly healthy looking either. But then we start to see death represented on its own in medieval art um, and Renaissance. And the, the Jonathan Hamilton example is a bit past pre-modern, but it looks so much like some of the album art that I had to put it in. Where, and this is where death starts to actually become more like a reaper figure. So looking less human and much more skeletal. Um, and what we found so fascinating about this was how calm the horses look in those examples. And Clara is going to talk a bit more about this. But again, it's that notion of the two working as one, you know, the horse is part of death and death is part of the horse. And we're seeing this across those cultural traditions. So that's your very quick gallop through the horse in art and iconography based on what we're going to talk about. And now I'll hand it over to Clara. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we looked at 99 examples of metal album art, <laughs> uh, and that's what we found. So in metal music, the horse appears on the cover, but it only seldom, seldomly appears in the lyrics. If it appears in the lyrics, it is only as a species mentioned, or a scenery, or as a means of transportation, or even only in verbs. The hero is riding, but it is not proclaimed on what or whom he is riding. We just assume that it is a horse. We looked at roughly, no, we looked at exactly 99 <laughs> examples uh, of metal album art uh, depicting an equine and tried to find noteworthy similarities in theme, aesthetic, or style of music. Equine was defined as a horse, donkey, or zebra, or the mythical creatures derived from the equine, mainly unicorn and pegasus. The fabled creature has to have at least an equine's head and not be part human to be defined as an equine mythical creature for our research. Most of the images show a more or less regular horse. In the end, we developed the following classification. Album art showed either an equine and a human or only an equine. Equine and human are depicted way more often than only an equine. The equine and human imagery can be parted into three main categories, warrior's horse, traveler's horse, and reaper's horse. We did not find zebras on metal album art and only one album art by the band Grand Bilias K depicting a Mediterranean or Arabic traveler on a donkey. The album is called On a Mule Rides the Swindler. So it's supposedly a mule, though it looks like a donkey. However, we did find metal adjacent rock albums depicting a zebra or donkey, but only one each. We did not find photographs of only horses, and only a few pages, for, uh, only a few photographs of horses and humans, the photographs mainly in the black metal genre. They like photographs, black and white photographs, of course. We did not find modern depictions of horse and human, as in depictions of present-day equestrian sports. Most of the humans depicted are male. The few female humans shown fall into the category of warrior. The albums choosing to show female warrior fall in the category of heavy glamour power metal. 
Of the equine fabled creatures, unicorn and pegasus are the ones which appear most frequently. The most popular horse's color is black, of course, and none of the riders adhere to safety instructions regarding wearing a helmet. So, <laughs> the classification is as follows. We divide the album art into horses and humans and horses without a human, as we said. Um, most of the album art falls into the category horse and human, as you can see on the left side, or more inclusive, equine and human-like. The green numbers indicate the quantities of album art we sort into that category, so you can see how many I counted for each category. The first subcategory, and the one with the most examples, is the category of the warrior's horse. This category depicts a horse and a warrior sitting on top of it, and most album art falls into this category, and uh, the imagery is depicting a, a weapon-wielding warrior on a powerful horse. So it's almost half of all the pictures we found are warrior's horse imagery. The second category is the traveler's horse. These images show a person on a horse, but this person is not a warrior, but a regular traveler. The traveler's horse category can set different moves in its imagery, while the warrior's horse is usually brave, glorious, and strong. The third category is that of the reaper's horse. These pictures depict a reaper with a horse, and the reaper's horse is the second biggest category with 27 images sorted into it. Other album art depicted only an equine without a person next or on top of it. There are far less examples for this category. The horses in this category appear in all kinds of aesthetic, mood, or symbolism, and each deserves an analysis of their own. Since there are not enough examples, we did not classify this category further. With that said, let's take a closer look at the subcategories. The warrior source. <laughs> when you look at the depiction of equines on metal album art, we soon discover a reoccurring imagery. Most metal album art depicts a horse and a human atop of it, human and horse as one. The horse is the warrior steed, united with man in power and glory. This imagery I will call the warrior's horse motif, the most prominent of the horse's depiction in metal. This motif does not seem to have any preference for time of release, metal subgenre or political background of the band. It can be found almost anywhere. Everyone likes the horse and the warrior. The warrior and the horse are most often the centerpiece of the art. The warrior usually sits atop the horse. There's one where the horse is in the background and the warrior is standing. It's from Elzefero. The horse is either rearing or galloping, showing its un unbridled whiteness, its power and strength. And these traits are usually implied to transfer to the warrior. Or the horse is proudly prancing away under the rider, presenting him or her as in control, as someone of impact and importance. In many images, there's nothing else or a foe is shown in the, in the per uh, periphery. Compared to the pre-modern art, many of the depicted warriors and horses are presented in a slightly more dynamic pose, while still keeping the warrior's assets like, assets like sword and shield. Some album art shows the image of certain cultural figures, for example the Valkyries or Odin on his eight-legged horse Sleipnir. The dragon slayer imagery, presumably St. George killing the dragon, is also reused in album art with Serenity. There's a, a knight killing a dragon. But let's take a closer look at the details. The warrior and their, or usually his horse, come in many cultural variants. Knight or Viking, Mongol or Samurai. The band can choose their type of warrior according to their own cultural background or the album's aesthetic or historical theme. The chosen theme usually corresponds to the cultural theme of the album or band, with certain subgenres unsurprisingly having a preference for a certain culture and or aesthetic. Folk and Viking metal will depict some form of Nordic warrior, while more, more classic heavy metal and power metal art tend to show a medieval knight. If no fitting aesthetic can be found, sometimes a horse-drawn carriage is depicted, as the one from Grave Trigger from the beginning, or the album art from King Diamond's Abigail or Iron Maiden's Death on the Road. Carriages still carry the symbolism of the horse's power, while simultaneously hiding and emphasizing the human leading, emphasizing him as in his absence, leading to a darker and more mysterious aesthetic while remaining powerful and energetic. Noticeably, the subgenres using warrior's horse imagery tend to center around themes of power, battle, and rebellion. The corresponding heavy folk and power metal seem to be the most interested ones in warrior's horse motifs. So, but there are subgenres to it, or smaller, minor subgenres. 
Aside from pieces where the warrior and the horse are the sole centerpiece, more chaotic battle scenes may also be depicted, though they are used less frequently than the warrior's horse option. The bands who depict battle scenes seem to play at least in part death or black metal. So I did not find any power metal band who's choosing this battle scene imagery on his album on their album art. Another one of the warrior's horse depiction variants seems to be especially reserved for the distinctly colorful and kitsch form of power metal, in which themes center around a glorious warrior, often a knight, and his noble steed, saving the world from dark overlords and slaying the dragon with his shiny blade. This album art also shows the warrior or knight, but instead of them being the centerpiece, the image centers around the task ahead, the dragon or the castle or whatever. Preforms of this image already appear in distinctively kitsch 80s heavy metal bands, which are more or less unknown today. The image is oriented on the centerpiece variant, but starts depicting the warrior in a fight against a foe, and the foe is clearly visible and not on the, on the corner of the picture. The warrior in these pictures also wears less armor than needed, presenting his muscular body, because they like it, as you can see in the Rhapsody picture. So... Next ones, now from warriors, horses to travelers horses. The power metal imagery has a noteworthy corresponding imagery in the category of the travelers horse. Not only power metal bands like to imply future events in their imagery, black metal bands do the same. Different from power metal, the aesthetic evokes loneliness and a sense of foreboding doom, not excitement and bravery. Still, the resemblance is uncanny. I don't know how many power and black metal fans like to hear this though. So, the Traveler's Horse. Some album art depict regular riders on horseback and not warriors. The horses stand calm, the rider does not openly wield a weapon. The mood differs. Sometimes the rider and the horse seem attentive and eager to go forward, as in the possessed steel cover on the left, um, or while others they seem exhausted, as the winter long cover there next to it. The connecting theme is that of uncertainty. We do not know where they go or where they come from. No, sub no subgenre shows a preference for this imagery. It is used all throughout the metal genre. Next up is the Reaper's Horse. With darker themes centering around death, suffering, and violence, but without uh, warrior's valor and glory, metal's figure is not only the warrior, but also the Reaper. The motives we saw at the beginning in the premodern art pieces, death on a pale horse and the four horsemen, are frequently used themes in the Reaper imagery. Especially black metal bands are fond of the horseman imagery. They really love it. Unsurprisingly, as the Reaper is, the horse is as well, as well either black or undead or both. But other than the warrior's horse, the Reaper's horse shows more emotional vari variety. It is not always energetic and strong, but sometimes calm or nervous. In calm scenery, the horse may be white or gray or pale because death is riding on a pale horse carrying a veiled ghostly figure, presumably personified death, on the left bottom corner from the slide. In more energetic or darker imagery, the horse itself is as undead as the reaper is, while the warrior's horse appears as either in unity, as either in unity with its rider, giving him access to his strength and energy, or as his living pedestal, the relationship between reaper and horse can be more equestrian or even friendship-like. But why place the Reaper on a horse? Undead animals might tick a slightly different aesthetic box. In being non-human, they arguably lose the close connection to our own symbol of mortality, a human body or skeleton. Especially the horse ha has even more points pointing to its harmlessness. It does not only bear the innocence of an animal, it is a herbivore animal, and furthermore, a companion animal. We know horses to be our friends, or at least not to be our foes. Showing personified death as having a companion we deem generally peaceful can lighten its horror as well as give it more life. Death has a creature to care for, and in turn, the creature, the socially trustworthy horse, trusts death. This romanticized reaper, as the one in the Thunder Horse picture, is shown very clearly yeah, on the Thunder Horse, like a uh, Thunder Horse after the fall on the, on the right side. Um, by being with a horse, Death seems to be more natural and closer connected to life. But placing death on a horse can work both ways because on a horse, death cannot be outrun. So he will catch up to you eventually. 
Adding a Reaper's force to the Reaper opens up the concept of death to be more ambivalent, as many metal bands like also to see death. Having a horse makes death more human, since death participates in the cultural practice of riding, might even show signs of social behavior like kindness. Only in interactions with others can death be gentle. Death alone cannot be portrayed as gentle because there's no one you can be gentle to. At the same time, the Reaper may appear even more real and powerful on a horse. With the Reaper on a horse, Metal's fascination with death finds a way to be expressed visually. Death is romantically sought after while simultaneously being feared. Then we have a different master category. Only the horse. <laughs> Pictures with only equines on them can be generally separated into undead and presumably alive horses or equines. Uh, we did not find zebras or donkeys. Interestingly, the metal adjacent rock music genre also likes to depict horses. For example, the, band Dark, the rock band Dark Horse, Dark Horse often depicts horses or like horse skeletons. Uh, Deep Purple Stormbringer album with a Pegasus on the top corner flying through the rainbow. Uh, Magnum's cover with a unicorn or many covers of the rock band Zebra. As you can see, the horses are presented within various types of aesthetic. The horse in the Mastodon album is in agony, evoking impressions of innocence, purity because it's of its white color, and powerlessness, for the horse is known to be a strong animal, but yet succumbs to an unknown antagonistic power in this image. Arctic Heart depicts the mythological horse Sleipnir, Odin's horse, and some images depict horses far more dangerous than they really look, playing with notions of horror through aesthetics of the uncanny, something Something supposedly harmless gets threatening, as in the stallion cover or possessed steel or stoned horses or fire breather. However, all these depictions of horses are so different from each other that they deserve an analysis of their own, taking into account what a horse may symbolize in art and culture. With this category, I close our presentation. We hope to incite some questions regarding aesthetics of the horse, masculinity and metal music, and any other questions which might have come to first to surface now. Maybe our first categorization of horses in metal album art gave a first overview over the material which is there to analyze, to be analyzed. So let me summarize our findings. The horse in itself is internationally known as one of the animals most influential, if not the most influential, for culture and society. It enables territorial expansion, easier travel, supremacy in battle against infantry, and can lend his superhuman strength to agriculture and production in general. The horse is known in almost any culture and is internationally know understood and known as a symbol of power and strength. Thus, metal art, which relies on the warrior's horse, horse imagery, has reason to believe that the general intended symbolism will be understood far beyond the borders of the band's own cultural environment. The horse, in its pre-modern context, through its power and strength, can also be seen as a symbol of masculinity, as it combines wildness with control. This is arguably the connection to the metal imagery because metal likes masculinity. The main imagery in metal is the warrior's horse. It makes up almost 50% of all equine album art we found. But when reading metal scholarship, it seems like the horse is not so much the warrior's steed, but only the asset of him as is the sword he is holding. Many works on masculinity seem to turn an eye on the horse. Also popular is the Reaper's horse in different forms, a swift reaper, a calm reaper, a skeleton reaper, a ghostly reaper, or a demonic kind of reaper. Horses without a human appear less often, but are not unheard of. The horse is the symbol of another ambivalence, supremacy and innocence, leading to a position of morally clean power. It is innocent because of its animality, even more so because it is a herbivore and a prey animal. Usually, a horse will not be dangerous unless directly threatened. It even looks harmless, but it is also noticeably stronger, bigger and faster than most other animals who are partner animals to us humans, except the elephant and the camel. These position of power, being physically superior to many other animals around humans, including humans themselves. Since metal often concerns itself with themes of rebellion, power and fighting within pre-modern and mythological contexts, and paired with metal's masculine aesthetic, the horse appears to be the symbol of choice. The horse is also culturally versatile enough to be adapted to any kind of aesthetic the particular band is going for. 
Noticeably, the horse is dropped if the band goes for a contemporary or futuristic theme, as well as for dreamy, melancholic, whimsical, whimsical or magical themes. The genre appearing only once within the album art is symphonic metal. Within contemporary or futuristic, futuristic aesthetic, the horse may appear in form of its symbolism, but has been already replaced by motorbikes on which one is riding today. Think of the well-known painkiller image by Judas, uh, Judas Priest. Only a few songs mention horses as more than being a warrior swift and strong steed, but Runa's Raido is one of the few examples dedicating the whole song to a horse. So what do we take with us after the presentation? It seems like the horse in metal art is the to be almost exclusively connected to a pre-modern theme or a pre-modern aesthetic, and it disappears when the aesthetic becomes contemporary. Thank you. That's it.